<clears throat> Hello and good time of day to all of you, my friends here on the Internet Chess Club. This is Grandmaster Alex Shermalinsky. Today is our, no, part of a traditional, uh, whatever Russian schoolboy knows, live. We have... Hello and good time of day to all of you, my friends here on the Internet Chess we have the final show, the second and final show on the FIDE Grand Prix second tournament that was concluded in Moscow Sunday. We're gonna take a look at the results of that tournament, uh, take a look at the, at the standings of uh, Grand Prix series, and uh, no, we'll talk about obviously future World Championship qualification and chances of various players have. So that's what it's going to be about. And of course, you know, I have some games to show you. Uh, yeah. Okay. So where to start? Well, I guess we we have to look at the final, final standings of the tournament. Well, I am uh, well, kind of happy to mention that for, for once I was right. I predicted that Dingler and will win this stage uh, outright. By the way, that was kind of a bold prediction. I, I made it. I made it when the tournament reached about half. Uh, it's half point. Well, obviously already Ding was among the leaders, but I thought that he was the one to uh, to make the final push, and uh, no, he did. Ultimately, in the last round. Well, the way this this thing is structured, if you look at the Grand Prix points, which is the far right column, right? Uh, then you can see it's quite a bit of difference, right? Okay, maybe in this case, Mamidyarov, who finished clear second, by the way, a rare, rare occurrence in any kind of Swiss tournament. You can be clear first, it happens, of course, uh, but clear second, no, that's unusual. But still, it's 30 points difference. But look at the guys who had what they call a good tournament, right? Good tournament. Not by their individual standards. No. Uh, but, but I mean like a good tournament. Uh, in terms of contributing toward your, your final score in the, the entire Grand Prix series. And guys like Rajab of Swidler. Uh, Grishuk, Nakamura, Vashiva Graf, and Anish Giri. No, they got almost a hundred points less than Ding Leran. Okay, we'll return to this, but if you, now we're gonna take a look at the at the standings, current standings after two events, and we'll see some interesting things here. Um Funny. Well, yeah. Your favorite chess teddy bear. Okay. Don't forget. Bears have claws. Okay. Uh, yeah, 280 points there. Uh, for for Shakri Armidyarov. So he combined his two results. I will remind you, of course, that you can see it from this, uh, from this table that he finished in a three-way tie for first place in Sharjah, 140 points. And Ding, who had one of those, as we call, good results, plus one, even after winning the next stage, clear, clear ahead of Mamidyarov, still was not able to catch up. So from this, I kind of surmised that um, finishing at plus one, which already happened twice, right? And it gives you around 70 points. It's not a good haul, no. I mean, you can probably afford only one of those. If you remember last week we were talking about, and I said, oh, well, 300 points would do. Now I'm, I'm not sure. I really am not sure that 300 points total, uh, three tournaments combined, would be enough to to finish in top two and therefore qualify for the candidates. Okay, am I am I catching all the 
Oh, the chat over there. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay, let me try to do something here. So I'm not, I'm not quite. Yeah. Okay, now this is better. I was just adjusting something on my computer. So I'll be able to see what you're saying. You like players who stick to two, three defenses, know everything about them, like Vashiva Graf, Rublevsky, easy to predict their openings, but hard to meet. Oh, yeah, but funny, funny thing is, you know, that, okay, MVL, well, kind of legitimate top 10 in the world player, we know that, but pardon me, who the hell is Sergei Rublevsky? All right, he was good in his day. Uh, but even even then, when he was his absolute best, suppose around the, uh, I don't know, the year 1999 or 2000, when we played actually in uh, one of the stages of the Las Vegas uh, World Championship knockout, and he eliminated me, but he didn't go very far. Just a serviceable grandmaster, as I would say. Funny thing that they, uh, hard to find another guy with, uh, with a narrow opening repertoire. And it's not only this being narrow, it's like well-oiled and, and deeply researched. So people are kind of tempted, all right, I'm going to bust this thing. And then they spend, well, either days beforehand, before the tournament, or hours be immediately before the game. Uh, and then, no, they have find it hard to bust. Uh, yeah, but there are more guys like this. To me, it's just absolute majority of today's uh, top players. They play very wide variety of openings. I would like to see more players who could start start the game with both e4 and d4. To me, it used to be, uh, no, some kind of some kind of sign of a of a really high high level player. Obviously, a lot depends, you know, what you do after that. <laughs> Nobody wins the game on move one. Uh, but nonetheless, like, think about Kasparov, uh, Karpov. Well, although in, in those it's interesting because it, uh, there is more often you, we see a transition from E4 later to include D4. Almost like all players who can, uh, for lack of a better word, ambidextrous, uh, they started off as E4 players and then they kind of converted into D4. People I mentioned, Kasparov, Anand, <clears throat> uh, somebody was just else. Oh, Peter Swidler, of course. No, Grishuk. Yeah, maybe it's a little harder for, uh, I don't know, born and bred, you know, D4 player uh, to include a D4 in the game. Uh, Kramnik has made uh, several attempts to do this, but no. I guess he's doing okay, you know, if you look at his position in number three in the world still. Volkov. No, Volkov is a popular teacher and uh, personality here on the internet chess club. Well, I don't follow his uh, his career that closely, you know, I have no idea what he, openings he plays. No, well, anyway, that's an interesting debate, you know, what makes one a world champion. Uh, to me, the common thing is, maybe with some exceptions, is the world champions so far, they're all supremely gifted chess players. Not every supremely gifted chess player became a world champion, although some of them came pretty close. Uh, but... I said a few exceptions. No, well, I won't mince words. Nobody would call Max Oewe an exceptionally chess genius. Nobody even, uh, you, nobody ever called him a chess genius. I mean, exceptionally gifted player, it's not the uh, kind of label we will attach to Oewe. I would also kind of... 
No, maybe it sounds harsh, you know. I, I'm not sure about Smith Wolf really fitting into this ranks. I know that Smith Wolf is many players' uh, favorite world champion. But I don't know. No, it's just my opinion. But yeah, most of the time, no, when we have... We have guys, you know, who get to stay there for a longer time, mm -hmm. not just to win it and then lose it back, you know, then there is some exceptional, exceptional talent behind it. Um, anyway, so I'm returning to the standings here now. If you can see that shaded areas there, the next stage in Geneva, that means that you, you're taking a buy. And that's interesting. So in those standings, what's happening now is that Ding uh, is going to take, uh, take a buy, right? He's not playing in Geneva. I think it, I think it helps him. Although, you know, you could look at this different, uh, in different way. Probably by the time he plays in Palma de Mallorca, he would already know how many points he, uh, he needs. No, well, you haven't seen much from Ding, you know. No, well, I'll, I'll show you some. I'll show you something today. No, well, we'll we'll talk about his chess. Uh, I personally think that Ding uh, belongs in the in this high um, no elite tournaments. You know, the highest level uh, of chess. <coughs> Sorry about that. I <coughs> got a little thirsty. Anyway, let's, okay, more speculations here. So I mentioned, you know, about this good result, a good quote-unquote, right? So 70 points. So you do it twice, right? You're pretty solid, you know, you score plus one twice, and then you, in one tournament, you, you strike, right? And then you play great, and, uh, no, well, and then, and then what? Let's look at Hikaru Nakamura, number five on this list. So he got his 141 and some fraction of a point. So he strikes now. And he wins and it just has a tournament like no we long expect from Hikaru Nakamura. Wins by score of plus five. 170 points. Alright. They would give him 310. Actually 311. Are you sure? Are you sure that would qualify him? There's no guarantee. Well, basically, from Mamidiaru's point of view, no, a reasonable result, which is for Mamidiaru, it's the same plus one score, well, it's going to put him over the top of 350 points. Now, Ding, you know, well, could need something more. But if Ding finishes at plus two, then no matter if Nakamura goes nine out of nine, He's not going to qualify. The top spots will be taken by Mamidyarov and Ding. So those are my uh, musings about, uh, about the system. Well, obviously Nakamura is also going to take a buy for the, uh, for the Geneva tournament, which is probably good for him because he's going to be real busy in... Uh, uh, in those tournaments, part of Grand Chess Tour, which are all bunched together in, uh, in the summer. They're going to play Rapid and Blitz in Paris, and then to Leuven, Belgium, and then the Sinkfield Cup, and then the new stage of the Rapid Sinkfield Cup in St. Louis. So that's pretty busy. So from that point of view, it's good for MVL and, uh, and Hikaru. Maybe it was set up this way, that they, uh, no, they're not going to be playing in Geneva. The Geneva tournament is in July. So they will... We will see after the Geneva tournament where they stand. Obviously, Grishuk needs to make a push. His uh, total score of 211 fraction points should be fattened by at least, you know, another, another 100 and, I don't know, 30 point result or something no. otherwise he stands absolutely no chance to qualify also what happened already that something predictable uh, that the players uh, the players that uh, 
I mean, players who compete, right? Well, they were consistent in, in both tournaments if, you, if they, when they played in both. We might say that out of this 24 player field, it's not 23, it's 24. It's just uh, in our Kiev and Rezantsov are equal uh, 23rd, 24. Uh, out of this group, you know, half the, half the guys, you know, they, they're simply not good enough, in my opinion. 12 players. And if you start it over again, wipe the slate clean and give, I don't know, Salem Saleh or Ernesto Narkiev another chance to play and then, uh, no. Probably if you, I mean, they may have one good result, but we already know, maybe even one exceptional result. Exceptional is better than plus one. No, well, but we already know that it takes more. They're simply not there chess-wise. Well, they may still be unhappy with their performance. I was personally shocked, you know, then Tomaszewski, who finished all nine games in draws in Moscow, gave this interview. I didn't read the whole interview, but it, I saw an excerpt from this, when he said, oh, I had a good tournament. You had a good tournament? You played nine draws. Then he goes into some kind of a no, well, defensive mode and says, of course I didn't win any game and it's hard to call it a good tournament, but I didn't lose any. I mean, talking about ambition, right? So the guy is happy that he didn't lose any. No, I understand everybody has to eat. And uh, no, well, from, there is one point of view that, well, we, okay, anyway, let's leave this. There is one point of view which has a right to exist that, you no know, chess players, there, you know, we should feel bad for them because, you no, know, they don't make the kind of money that NBA players or NFL players make. And, uh, well, and he's a good player and, and all that. Okay. So, therefore, the world owes, owes him a living. And I guess a decent one. We're not talking you know, welfare level payments. I don't know. Some people believe in this. I don't. Well, not a bad system, but they could have picked stronger players. Okay, who are the stronger players uh, that are not on this list? Actually, Levon Aronian was on this list, and he's gonna go higher. He just had a disaster tournament in Sharjah with only scoring seven points. And that's another story, right? When you, when you really fall off the cliff and have really bad tournament, then even if you win it twice, I doubt that would qualify him. Okay, now he wins it twice, you know, outright, you know, that's another story, yeah. Then 340 points. Anyway, uh, about replacing some players from this list and getting somebody else that, that would make things more interesting and maybe have a chance. Well, the most common name that comes in, in mind, household name, is Vasily Ivanchuk. No, obviously, like, no, Ivanchuk is Ivanchuk. He's a, he's a significant... Uh, significant figure, you know, in the in late 20th, early 21st century chess. He has certainly done enough to deserve uh, to be mentioned. Well, he's probably, realistically speaking, didn't have the kind of results Kasparov and Anand had. And I would even put Tapalov uh, ahead of him, because Tapalov at least was able to win when it counted. Um, Ivanchuk, but of course we know, an individual game, he's a, always a very dangerous player and probably will remain one. Would he be able to uh, to sustain it through three tournaments like this Grand Prix event? There's absolutely no way. Now, this, this is exactly where Ivanchuk, I, I don't see him doing well. Yeah, one tournament maybe, but there is a lot of draws there, and he'll probably get a little frustrated with that and lash out with some strange opening choices. He always uh, always does in such cases. I don't see Wanchuk making any kind of impact on this tournament. 
on the on the race for the top two spots. Uh, I don't know who else besides the one check is missing. Of course, you're, uh, there are your favorite chess players. Uh, I don't know, Rublevsky or Volkov, but okay, let's get real. Who's missing? David Navarro? That would be another one of those guys who basically bounce around 50% and they probably could always have what I call the good result, which is plus one. I mean, Navarro is not a youngster anymore. Uh, he's been around already for a long time, for 10 years. He would, he would play okay and uh, he's able to to score heavily against the lower levels of competition and he could pad his rating up to maybe to 2750 and then no he goes off for him you know and then he drops his I don't know 25 or 30 points so he already bounced between 2720 and, and 2750 quite a few times way that is a very good point you know what happened with way at some moment before the start of the sh of the entire cycle of Sharjah tournament. Okay, we'll get to Indian players. Let's talk about WE. It was announced that WE was on the list. Uh, apparently, maybe the Chinese Chess Association tried to push him through. Anyway, he was there instead of Hui Fan. And then they published a list of players again and Hui Fan was there. And uh, that was all. Hardly any explanation. Almost like they uh, it looked like that Fide or this mysterious outfit called Aegon simply forgot to include uh, who you find on the list. And she said, I always wanted to play. I don't know why I wasn't there. Marazevich. No, yeah, full potential, but we, we're talking. I don't know, full potential of Marazevich to reach. Mm. I don't know. I think when I think when Marazevich turned 30, he already started showing signs of decline from 2007 on. It coincided, you know, with the uh, with that tournament in San Luis that Tapalov won brilliantly. And, uh, maybe that was Maybe that was really a chance for Marazevich to do it, but uh, but some years later and already for a long time, Marazevich is. No, he doesn't even show that results on the level of 2700, and he's not really that old, right? Considering that he's nine years younger than Gelfand. No, anyway, the total individual curve of development and individual curve of decline. Yeah. Okay, anyway, let's look at some chess. Now, this was the game. Uh, I didn't show you this game, did I? No, I don't think I did. I'm trying to recall, you know, I'm get, I get a little bit confused. Um, anyway, but I don't think I did. Anyway, so this game was played, uh, hang on a second, you know what, let me try to open my chess base, so I get some, so I get to see my analysis, and it will help me also to, uh, to find uh, what round it was, uh, it was played in. Uh, okay, hang on, hang on. We're not in a hurry, are we? I guess we're not in a hurry. It was round six. Uh -huh. Okay, let me move it out of the way. So I can see my analysis, we, uh, analysis as we go along. And... Uh, Minimize the chess base thing. Okay, um, round six. Maybe it was, was played on the same day when when we had our our show. Okay, let me see. If it ended Sunday round nine, Saturday was round eight. 
Yeah, it was played Thursday. So, well, I honestly don't remember if I had this game covered. But anyway, let's go. Um, important game for both players because this is where your second half of the tournament begins. And uh, you have to make this, this push. Ding was in a somewhat better position, I believe. Let me double check. Ding Liren. Yeah, he won two consecutive games in rounds two and three. So he was half point ahead. So what I like about Ding is that he, well, he respects his opponents, which is part of you know, character in him, obviously. He's never disrespectful and he will never be um, to anyone. So therefore he respects the game. Uh, he also has a healthy dose of ambition. You know, I think that's what was somewhat lacking in the previous generations of Chinese players. And um, so it's a an, it's an, uh, necessary ingredient to, no, to achieve ultimate success. Now, it still kind of remains to be seen how far Ding uh, can go, but but I think he could, he's, he's not done with his uh, with his improvement we shouldn't forget also that he's young you know almost, almost all chinese players are young on average you know they're younger than than others if you had a match uh, china against the world now and say i don't know five boards then most likely the chinese the best chinese team uh, players would be younger on average by age then say Carlson, Caruana, and Carlson, so Caruana and MVL, you know. So, well, uh, I just caught myself thinking it was recently that, I mean, this great year, 1990, right? When a lot of best players, you know, were born the same year. Uh, Magnus Carlson, Sergei Karyakin, uh, Maxim Vashilagrav, Jan Nepomnishi. Even Dmitry Andreykin, if we go a little lower. Speaking of them, maybe Andreykin actually would be a kind of a dark horse, a little bit competitor in this Grand Prix thing. That, but it depends really. Um, I mean, I can only speculate about Andreykin, but at times it appears that he is he's not acting like a professional chess player. But no, okay, anyway. But Ding, you know, certainly, certainly is. And then I, I read somewhere that, <laughs> funny, Ding was accompanied by his mother, who somehow was able to cook home meals for him during the tournament. Wow. And uh, so he attributes his success to, uh, to this kind of home atmosphere created by, created by his mother. Hmm? So he's trying to make a push this round six. He's white. Yeah, Vasheva graph. Okay, so they go for this. It's all standard issue. Bishop is seven. A3 castles before. And then we all play the smooth rook e8. Mm. Yeah, it used to be the main move. Uh, I think bishop e6 was considered near automatic. Obviously, we, we see the pattern, right? It's the it's like the dragon, quiet li li lines of the dragon with the colors reversed. I mean, since uh, even the theory of the dragon doesn't promise much, white much of an advantage unless he castles long and goes h4 for the Yugoslav attack. Um, here, with that extra tempo for white, and also black had to remove the knight from the center to avoid those tricks with knight takes e5. Now, clearly, uh, white's comfortable, but sometimes that uh, that area when we talk about uh, openings with the covers reversed, that area of comfort. Mm, it can be stretched 
in the sense that uh, yeah well white has a white has a good position but if you look uh, at this position from black's point of view i mean if you're if what white has now is black uh, in the dragon then you feel much greater about your chances because no the difference between between this and what you may end up in the dragon being basically checkmated with h4 h5 is is so big you know that you know it makes you feel much better about this position but in this situation you have the white pieces and well it's comfortable but is it really uh, comfortable doesn't mean you know that you you have realistic grounds of playing for advantage you can play on i mean what is white to do basically what's white's plan i can only see two it's either push b5 and try to open win the e5 pawn and open the diagonal for the bishop all the way to b7 or somehow transfer the knight to c5 okay let's see d3 and now one line goes a5 so black challenges immediately this and knight d4 that's a known idea on knight takes a5 black plays bishop f6 actually one player uh, david howell of england Oh, interesting comment about his mother. You doubt that she cooked? No, maybe not at tournaments, but I can hardly imagine a Russian woman of that generation not cooking. That would be just... No, that would be a shock for me if she, if she didn't cook. Even to these days, you know, no... I mean, Russians, even if they find themselves in the... Living in the different parts of the world, you know, they maintain this thing, you know, that uh, home cooked meals are the centerpiece of everything. But anyway, interesting comment. Fabian recently moved out on his own. Yeah. No, I was going to say about time at 25, but. Hmm. No, I guess it's different now. Yeah. The previous generation of kids used to move out, I don't know, right out of high school. You know, you move out because, you know, you're legally an adult at 18, so. Go make your way in the world. Now, obviously, things are different, but no, for chess players as well. All right, so returning to this. So David Howell in this position played, he, he went for this line. He played the exchange sacrifice. Well, White loses the exchange because the threat is queen d4 check of the night he even won that game against Daniel Naradetsky but I'm not sure it was a convincing victory well it was repeated a few times and then black started winning main problem of course that uh, white's little lose there and uh, black of course will return with the knight to d5 after grabbing the exchange on a1 uh, I don't think this would have happened uh, because already Vashia Vagraf himself, instead of capturing the spawn, played bishop b2. So he had this game uh, against uh, uh, Polish Grandmaster Darius Swierch. It went as follows. Knight b3. Okay, that was the whole idea. Karyakin played it successfully, occupied the b3 square. No, but maybe it's not the end of the world, because white does get to play this. And now we have the bishop open all the way to b7. So Swerch took a chance of getting the bishop pair. Rook b8. No, once again, you know, if you get this kind of position with covers reversed, with normal covers, and you would, you would be ecstatic, you think, look at my dragon now. He has no threats whatsoever. 
I'm the only one playing on the queen side. I have the pawn on b5. Pardon me. I, uh, the last move I played was wrong. It was, of course, queen takes b2. Clicked on the wrong piece. So you would be ecstatic, right? Oh, that's such a great position. And, uh, and by... Um, Okay, since you escaped all the dangers and your dragon and got this position after 17 moves, then if things proceed as planned, you know, another 17 moves and you'll be winning, right? Okay, at least with large advantage. Maybe winning on move 51. Um, yeah, but when you're a white, uh, no, you understand that success is quite limited here. The pawn on a3 is... Uh, what the best that you can accomplish is, is to try to put pressure against c7, which can always be protected with the move bishop d6. Since you're probably going to have to move this pawn, you're also going to be surrendering the b4 square for the opponent's bishop. In reality, this position is equal. Vadim Milov. Nasty personality. I uh, I played him many times. No, he is a little uh, I don't know rough around the edges here. Yeah. What happened? You let Swidler and Short use your laptop during tournament, but not Milov. Ah, so oh, I see. I don't know. So what did they do with your laptop? Did they go to some websites, you know, triple X rated or whatever? What did they do? Why did they need your laptop? Lamy Smates when camping never grow beyond 26-25. I ask this question. No, well, some answers, I get different answers. Uh, one, uh, one answer was from Jan Timon who said, oh, just not talented. Okay, obviously, next to Jan Timon, maybe indeed, you know, they just don't have the, the talent it takes. They also seem to be nice kids, you know, they're well-spoken, and some of them for sure are educated. Uh, but maybe Timon had a point. Well, I don't know. Timon was a combination of talent and also Timon loves chess. So uh, he always worked on chess. I don't know if his health allows him to continue, well, but, but he was always like that. Ah! Sweet were bets online. Ah, and short went on ICC. Mm. Interesting. Okay, but well, you keep your tabs on these guys, you know, when the, you can tell a lot about a person by uh, where they, I mean, how they use their computer. <laughs> of course, cricket matches, naturally. Well, that's essentially important for, no, right. Yeah, uh, for Peter Swidler. So I'm thinking of this position, if... Uh, if White gets this, probably Dingler and wasn't too excited to get this. But then again, hard to tell uh, how he would uh, the game would have continued after Bishop e6. But then we all plays rook e8. And now, what's the point of this move? In case of standard procedure d3, Black does this. Rook protects the pawn, knight d4 becomes available. Bishop b2, and now same thing, a5, b5, and then there. All right, what it does, you know, for now, the pawn on a5 is protected. Uh, but white, of course, can play knight d2, and most likely he will play knight d2. This actually already occurred in the game between Luke Van Willy with white, and the same Maxim Vashiva graph with black. So I guess Ding, you know, had some... had something to base his preparation on. 
No, I can I can tell what's what's going on here. I guess the the game will go on. Who knows? And now Ding played his his move. E3. Now this is an ambitious move and somewhat unusual configuration of the pawns over there. Well, this is the kind of move you almost never play in the dragon, right? The black side. Stellwagen became professor in America. Ah, what field? Is he in some kind of science engineering? I mean, I don't know. I guess we all think that the grass is greener on the other side. Mm. Being a professor in America. I mean, I don't know. First of all, it's always a long way to go before you get uh, full professorship with tenure and all that. If you're just assistant professor, meaning, you know, that you're year to year, it's actually nothing special. Neither money-wise or, or lifestyle-wise. Hmm, interesting. I didn't know. Health, science, what, what's that? What's that? Huh, hard to tell. Usually, you know, when... When a person advertises uh, themselves as health specialist, you know, well, at best, you know, they're a masseur, you know, at worst, no, well, you know what comes after the massage. Oh, gee, I shouldn't be talking to you. Ah, anyway. Yeah, no. I hope he's doing okay, but... I don't know, come to think of that, you know, well... I guess maybe he grew up, maybe the real answer to... Uh, to this whole thing, why the young Dutch players, they don't repeat the success of... Um, ten boards. Oh! No PhD in chemistry? No, well, yeah. PhD student. No, all right, that's fine. Okay, anyway, you know, I'm not there, but uh, I, I don't really know him. And, but what I'm thinking, if... Okay, that's not what I'm thinking, what I was told, but I probably shouldn't uh, name the names. Timon obviously doesn't care. You can quote him left and right, you know. So he's already in that age, you know, and people don't care what others uh, think about him. Uh, but not everybody is like this. So basically, the a theory was that, well, these guys, no, well, they grew up in this uh, chess-friendly environment in, in Holland. No, chess players are stars. Okay, maybe not as much as soccer players or whatever, or speed skaters, but, but nonetheless, you know, I, I can attest to that. I, I obviously don't speak Dutch, you know, but I, when I was there, I saw, like, the entire pages of newspaper devoted to the tournament I played in. I mean, clearly, uh, and I I know in Waikanzi, you know, right, a small place and they got used to chess players, but uh, but I'm sure, you no, know, Timon is easily recognized and, and all that. All the celebrities. So maybe that status uh, they achieved Maybe talented players, young players, I know, 2600, 2650. Well, maybe they didn't feel any motivation to necessarily work harder to to elevate their game on next level. Because they thought that they already made it and they achieved everything was there to achieve. Ah, uh, what's from Brazil? Carlos, what's from Brazil? It's almost like you... Are you, are you completing the sentence you typed before? No, I don't see it. Uh, okay. Anyway, let's think about this move E3. Now, this is totally un, undragon-like, right? So it has this... But it has a point of taking away the D4 square. How does... Black get punished when he attempts to mix E3... Well, I mean, E6 with G6. So, 
certainly by playing night before and then occupying the d3 square. No, this is not going to happen. Clearly, you know, that the black knight doesn't have access to the square. White can consider going d4. No, it's an isolated pawn, but no, it will give him some, some active play. So e3 is legitimate. And I, when I saw this move played during this game, I thought, oh man, novelty. No, it wasn't. It was actually an old idea of Sergei Makarichev, the Soviet Grandmaster. They played it back in 1991. I mean, wow. Okay. A6. No, right. B5 was a threat, right? Understandable. Now, Queen C2. Some kind of hedgehog, you know, maybe white is building up. And he also stops to move bishop f5. Another way of getting a hold of the d3 square. It became really interesting. And this. Bishop g4. Now Ding played knight a4. I don't know if it was home prep or not. It is hard to tell. The people, they don't have to tell you after the game. Hmm. From the looks of it, it was probably over the board idea. Interesting. In the Netherlands, you still need to make money somehow grow bigger. Means you have to work in another job or, or play. No, obviously you can't just sit there, you know, and play the Dutch championship and and maybe why can a tournament once a year? You obviously have to do more. And uh, while the culture is still there, but obviously there used to be many more tournaments. I remember there used to be, um, aside of Waikansi, there was the Oewe uh, Memorial in the summer in Amsterdam. And there used to be uh, some other events. There used to be a Tilburg thing, you know. Well, obviously, maybe, no, well, maybe the high day of, uh, uh, of Dutch chess not in terms of accomplishments of individual players, in terms of uh, popularity of the game and the, and the financial support of the game has already passed. But so is in many, many other, on many other levels in the same society. Well, we realized that we can turn back the clock and bring back the, the good old days or the bad old days, whatever they were. No, different countries, different cultures, they, they move from uh, from their starting points or whatever, intermediate points. Russia obviously used to be Soviet Union, socialism or communism, whatever you call it. And now, and, well, well, Northern European countries, they used to be those great welfare states, you know, when the, you know, you, you basically wrapped in a cocoon, you know, of state support, you know, from from day one to your last day on this planet and uh, but no well, no matter what what was before and america was this great unfettered capitalism where you hop from one job to another and expect to get 20 percent uh, pay raise you know every time you do this i remember those days hmm. but uh, i guess now we live in the new reality of 21st century whatever it is you guys probably know it better than i do One thing I heard, and maybe moving Dutchman will uh, will confirm it, but uh, no, the quality of education is higher in in the Netherlands compared with many other countries. So, no, basically, if you go to college, a college level of education requires quite a serious commitment, quite a serious commitment, which is not the case, obviously, in the United States and wasn't necessarily like this even in the USSR. So that's why guys like what, Van Willy and Timon, I don't think they ever went to college. But okay, it's kind of decision you make. Okay, so knight e4, why am I thinking that this move was not preparation? Because I'm not sure about... If uh, I'm not sure if, if Ding actually anticipated what uh, MVO's reply. 
А, хай ти його. Де це був 5? Ну, не C5. Ну, добре. Я мовчав на C5 сквер. Looks particularly good after the C6. We hit B7. While we are trying to invade the six, there is this check. The black bishop is now maybe overextended outside the five pawn, not protecting this critical diagonal. And the white looks beautiful, but e4. What exactly do we do with this? With this uh, knight. Here is what I was thinking. Suppose this, right? It's an attempt. Black can, in return, possibly... Uh, no, but I don't think you can entertain this, right? You take the queen and then comes this. You're trying to get a lot of pieces. But then the knight on d8 is alive, and then the weakness of the diagonal is, is going to doom you, because it's knight f7, and then smothered check. We go in nuts over... Oh, I mean, you're talking President Trump. Ну, no, well, uh, I mean, I don't know. I'm not really in a position to encourage this kind of political discussion here. But, well, if uh, if you ask me, you know, I don't. I think only people with a lot of time in their hands and otherwise, uh, no kind of stable lives, they won't care, you know, who's the president out. I mean, it's, God, I don't know. They're like what, two thousand miles away? Would I even care, you know, like about Washington D.C.? I haven't been there, you know, in, in years. And uh, whatever they, they say over there has very little impact on my life. I mean, they might make an impact, you know, if they start, I don't know, if they start a nuclear war. Okay, but until they, they did it, you know, I absolutely don't care what they do and who they are. Uh, there was this guy, Obama, I think his name was, you know, so he was there, you know, I, a lot of people took offense, you know, that he was the president, you know, I mean, pff, I mean, bring him back, you know, tomorrow, I wouldn't care. Nothing changed. So anyway, here I can see that something changed, you know, the smothered mate coming up. Uh... So by playing this, white can establish some kind of connection there with the knights, right? So you can do that. But I'm thinking, is, is it really so great for him? I mean, black probably can take. So we take back with the knight and then there is something reasonable like this move. And I suppose you're going to go bishop b2. What else to do, right? I mean, he's clearly on the knight. Uh, so bishop b2 and now it seems maybe maybe white could count on some advantage here but in order to solidify his advantage he absolutely must to bring this bishop back into play he really has to without that no he can't so he needs time to play d3 and this is where that nasty little move knight a4 may, may screw everything up because you can't maintain this bishop on the diagonal, which is needed to protect the knight. And if not, you know, then he takes on b2 and then attacks d4 and... Uh, I mean, white actually has to scramble here, not to get worse. Because he's in clear danger of simply losing the pawn on d4. Knight takes b2 will create a pin. Even if the knight escapes there and we somehow unpin thanks to this check, eventually from b3 then we leave the d2 pawn backward pawn i don't think we can do both uh, no save that pawn save the knight on d4 and uh, complete our plan with d3 so this kind of knight connection on the d4 square was not good enough so he went knight a1 no in itself knight a1 is not disaster we see it time and again 
in the various variations of the Benoni, for example, or uh, uh, or even the Pierce defense, where Black just in reply to white pawn moving forward in, in the middle goes back knight a8, and then he hits the pawn. It's a target. So same thing obviously is here, but no problem is this move. Did Ding see this whole thing? Well, I already, I already expressed my opinion on the um, nice life in Scandinavian countries. To me, anytime I hear about a ten-dollar beer or twelve-dollar beer at a bar somewhere, life doesn't seem nice to me at all. In fact, you know, it, I don't know. It just, it just feels cold and cruel. Life with twelve-dollar beers. Ah, uh, Kuprechik, yeah, I played him three times, actually, I, uh, I will be working, beginning tomorrow, I will be working on little tribute, I didn't know Victor that well, you know, but there's still nine years difference between us, he was older, by like nine years, but we played and the games were tremendously exciting, I tried to out Kupre, uh, Kuprechik himself. Kuprechik at J, well, say how, how people have forgotten, you know, Kuprechik is, was one of the most exciting attacking players, representatives of uh, his generation, which he was born in, uh, I believe, in the year 1949, and played in the 1970s and 1980s in the USSR. He's from Belarus, and until recently, until his passing just a few days ago, he always played in senior tournaments. Over 65. Person needing health insurance with... Uh, well, it's hard to avoid political... No, okay, it's not even politics, it's real life. I tell you what, you know, well, uh, with the kind of co-pay, you know, that, that I have out of pocket, I mean, yeah, probably I would need my health insurance, you know, when I really kill over with the heart attack. Otherwise, I'll be totally financially ruined. Although I think I would be ruined anyway, because it's still some kind of... They only pay a certain percentage. And from uh, my point of view, does it make any difference if I'm in a hole for, for $100,000 or half a million dollars? I'm ruined anyway. You know, so that's... And as far as, you know, daily life, like doctor's visits, so basically pay out of your pocket anyway. Because by the time you reach that deductible, goodness, I don't go to doctors that often. I can, I never ever, you know, reached my deductible. So they would start paying for something. It, it has, hasn't happened in years and years and decades here. So sorry about that, you know, well, I don't see no difference between the Obamacare or Republican, Trump care or whatnot, you know, I know that uh, I'm going to have to reach in, deep in my pocket to pay next time that I need to go see a doctor. That's how it is. No, also I commented, you know, well, yeah, well, I don't live in Nebraska, Nebraska South for me, I live in South Dakota, but I mean, I don't only represent my own point of view, you know, there are a lot of people I know here who feel exactly the same. We always joke, you know, like, okay, suppose, what's the worst that can happen? The Chinese will take over, right? Because, you know, they, whatever, you know, so we, can, we become a Chinese protectorate of sorts, you know. They will, will still grow food, you know, the same way we, we grow food now to be distributed, you know, by Washington, D.C. So Beijing would be distributing it. What's the difference? We won't even notice the difference. But anyway. Uh, so, the rook gets trapped. There it goes, d3. A plan must continue. Plan must continue regardless. You know, white breaks this whole thing up. And now, the value of this bishop arguably becomes as uh, great as the value of the rook on a8. Now, this is not a new idea, uh, but no, still brave play from Ding. So now happens this. 
and Black feels that he needs to no, protect the pawn on f4, at least for now, and uh, reduce the number of pieces on the board. Obviously, combination of this knight on c5 taken on b7, that knight and then the diagonals open was too much to handle. So. And we all place the logical move now and brings the knight to d7. Now, interesting. Um, yeah, I like to move knight d7. Takes, takes, and takes. So, on, as they say, on paper now, white's doing fine. Every time you have a bishop pair and a pawn, in kind of a open position, a semi-open position, for rook and knight, you, you know, you have to be doing well. Even by a standard count, you know, since the bishop pair that probably adds, you know, like a little bit to the value and then bishop pair is probably worth seven points, right? And okay, with the pawn and then this rook and knight, possibly even more. Obviously, it depends on the position. Uh, however, there are a few factors here that doesn't, when they all come together, that they don't make this position safe for either side. My opinion on what? Uh, oh, on the political stuff. No, well, yeah. I mean, my, sometimes, you know, I know I sound disillusioned, you know, and bitter about this whole thing, but that's what it is, you know, like that. That's the same thing. I mean, I don't know. Some people, maybe they take pride, you know, seeing the their country represented by a, a nice family dressed to the, to the nines, you know, and whatever, traveling the world and getting some kind of royal treatment from, you know, foreign powers and, and all that. To me, I don't know, well, doesn't make me feel anything, to be honest. <laughs> You know, whatever it is, either, either it's Ivanka Trump, you know, who, by the way, I don't think anybody voted for, you know, strutting around there in her designer gowns, or Michelle Obama eating her lobster dinners, you know, whatever they are, you know, like, uh, I mean, they, okay, fine, they got it made. Congratulations. Okay, so bishop takes e4, so the aiming at h7. But neither side is safe here. Obviously, the black king, and particularly, it was, it was made unsafe with the next move. Queen is seven, but this is typical MVL. You know, MVL, I think he's trying to rein himself in all this, because he knows, no, I'm the top five in the world or whatever. And uh, I have to play, like, maybe solid chess. But uh, deep down inside, I think he's no, an emotional creature, no, as it as should be. I guess, if I stereotype, you know, Frenchman somewhat, and he gets excited and he just can't, can't stop himself from, from challenging the opponent face to face. Uh, so this move queen is seven. I mean, seriously, how many of you guys would consider anything but knight f6? How many of you would look at anything else but, I mean, look at the great move knight f6. You protect h7 and you hit that bishop. And you get your knight kind of in a position where it protects your king the best. How is it possible not to play this move? You really have to be an exceptional player to even consider anything else. But MVL figures, no, no, knight f6, not enough. I want that pawn on c5. I'm taking the pawn on c5 and I'm... Uh, I'm equalizing pawns, and uh, I'm not going to give him a chance to play long term with compensation. He simply wanted to bust white. Chinese player and the candidates would influence the viewership. No, not at all. Chess and uh, European variety, uh, which uh, Chinese chess is a different game, right? Every time you use the term, you know, Chinese chess, in the same way, say, American chess or Russian chess, we, we actually, we're not actually correct, because Chinese, the Chinese chess is a different discipline, different game, or different sport, if you wish. Um, so we should be using chess in China. 
Uh, chess in China is not that popular. They don't really have the numbers that were reached once in the old USSR in terms of like scholastic competition and uh, amateur players who play in tournaments and nowhere near the nowhere nowhere near the numbers in the United States. In the United States, no, we have tens of thousands of people playing regularly in chess tournaments. In the no, there are members of the USCF. Well, I'm not sure that's the, that's the case in China. No, they have. Uh, I think they treat chess about the same way we treat. I don't know, mm, fencing. Okay, so well, we have some fencers and whatever. Uh, uh, you know, in the uh, here in the US, uh, speed skating. No, yeah, come the Olympiad, you know, we would cheer them on if they're good enough to win medals, we'll be very happy. But it doesn't mean that the sport itself is, is popular. The same way in China. They will root for the guy, you know, for Ding, for the first time. But as far as like the, uh, they're throwing money into chess. I mean, look, they used to have this big tournament in Ninbo, or what's the name, that Magnus Carlsen used to go and win every year. Where did it go? They don't even have a tournament or a super tournament in China. And that's considering that they won Chess Olympiad and World Team Championship. Men, not women, men. So I don't know, I don't think so. I think they... I don't expect, you know, like suddenly millions and millions of dollars, you know, pour into, into chess. I don't expect a period regardless of what happens. No. Chess has its own place, its own niche, and it will probably continue like this. But it's sign of times, obviously, that uh, we only care about the best players. And the rest of them, the Volkovs and the, and the Yermalinskis, no, well, I mean, they had their chance and their blood. Now, if they can somehow survive on the fringes, I mean, I'm not complaining, you know, I'm, I'm, I never thought I would live such a good life, you know, and uh, last year in my 50s, you know, I'm in fantastic situation and, uh, well, mainly thanks to you guys, because you're here listening to me. Um, but, uh, no, well, it's surviving on the fringes. So, he didn't play knight f6. Okay. So... All right, Black can stabilize the situation. That's what I'm talking about, that MVL is a kind of player he is. Uh, he may come to the game with certain game plan, but when shots are fired, his uh, cautious plans usually go out the window. And then, no, his uh, temperament takes over. So he didn't like this position, although... I don't particularly see any problems here. One thing that Black can do in this position is to keep that knight from coming out, right? The knight coming to f4 would improve White's position, but the knight cannot come out. If you wonder if the bishop should have been on f3, I don't know, that's going to be queen h3 at some moment. It's probably not, not healthy. No, as this check, possibly, and maybe even this. To play knight e5. Hmm? I don't believe that black should be worse here. I don't see white using these central pawns effectively. If these pawns were rolling up the board, you know, then, okay, forget it. But... But on the other hand, of course, white is, looks in pretty good shape as well. And it's difficult to see black no, improving so much that he can uh, obtain a clear advantage here. So MVL says no, he plays queen e7. That is risky. Now takes, bishop there, rook of eight. Rook b1. Then knight c5. One, one has to be a very brave player to engineer this kind of trade. Give up the pawn on h7, which is half of your pawn shield in front of your king, to get the pawn on c5. 
And you... And you will stay here supporting Uncle Yerma. Of course, support me by all means. Oh, well, yeah, I'm your favorite... Uh... Okay. <laughs> Chess internet personality, I, I, I take it, you know, son of all. I'd like to stick around and entertain you for as long as the, I can pay my bills here. Oh. <laughs> And those things are connected, you know. I promise that I, I will never quit on you guys. Professionalism and the importance of results nowadays fortunately kill attacking chess. Kasparov and Tapalov. Yeah. No, well, that Kasparov and Tapalov, they, they had this foundation of, of aggressive chess. Uh, in there since they were young players and then they were able to incorporate computers into into their chess they had even made their their chess sharper on the initial stages but now we're talking what we're talking 10 years since uh, pardon me we're talking 12 years since kasparov retired and 10 years since tapalov was at his best winning the san luis tournament was it was it 2007 or 2008? And then he lost that uh, dramatic match to Anand. And while he had some good results and even rating surge to 28, 26 at some moment, a year and a half ago or so. I mean, in general, for the world championship aspirations for Veselin, it was all downhill. Knight b7 instead of knight a1. We should study that. Let me finish that thought. I'm, I'm thinking. Uh, but once that computer and computer preparation became uh, widely available, available to anyone, then it's, you can't get any advantage. I'll give you one example. Wesley saw. Okay, so Wesley... Until recently, at least, now he has this guy Tukmakov, but I knew Tukmakov quite well. Tukmakov, even in his best uh, chess playing days, was not really a big theoretician. And, uh, no, he's a kind of a smart guy, and a lot of things that he says, you know, that you should listen to, but, but I mean, it's not like, you know, Tukmakov was sitting there with some secret analysis and uh, supporting, uh, no, whatever, Anish Giri with them, and then their, their partnership dissolved, and now he's doing the same for Wesley So. I don't think there is anything in particular, you know, that prepared by Tukmakov. The point is, you know, that uh, even a guy who sits there by himself can pretty much run those powerful computer engines and uh, stay abreast with... Uh, developments on modern theory and on many fronts, not just in one opening, on many openings. If you just do it regularly every day, you know, you, well, the question is, it's not how to find those moves. The computer will find them for you. The question is how to memorize them all and not to get them all uh, rolled into one and hopelessly mixed up into some kind of a blur. Uh, yeah, so therefore the advantage of this... Uh, which Kasparov and Tapalov had, they were just simply ahead of others, but others caught up. At that time, you know, still, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, all well, the computers weren't that strong, you know, to do things on their own. And Kasparov, he wrote about it. You have to constantly guide the computer and point the computer in the right direction, feed the computer with your ideas, and then the computer produces something. So Kasparov felt that the computer was his slave. That's why it appealed to him. That's why he liked this advanced chess. Do you remember that man plus computer matches he had against Shirov and somebody else, Anand, in Leon, Spain? I think Gary, you know, due to his character, you know, he simply loved it, you know, that, um, no... He thought of himself as a, you know, ancient uh, hero like Tamerlan or Alexander the Great or whatever, you know, just sending those numerous troops, you know, 
into battle, you know, and they die, but they die for greater cause to make Garrick Kasparov stronger. I mean, this is his view of the world, basically. No, and it's never gonna change. This is how he grew up, and this is how he is gonna be. Uh, but uh, the reality, it didn't last very long. Now, let's look at this thing. Instead of knight e1, we go knight b7. Okay, now go back. That knight is gonna be seriously stuck. So we go queen d5, right? Protect the knight on c6. This knight is still under attack. Knight back, right? I don't think capturing the spawn is uh, worth the trouble, to be honest. I mean, there is still the same idea. Clearly, to go after the exchange. I find this knight in a precarious situation, to say the least. Oh, I didn't watch the speeches. Who, who won today? Giri or so? That's on a different server. I don't even know if Karia can beat uh, Georg Meyer. I, uh, I didn't have a... I know, to be honest, well... Uh, I mean, I kind of like when they play the slow five minutes and two second increment, you know, at least I can follow, but... Well, this bullet thing, you know, I, uh, I, I don't find this exciting at all. To me, it becomes very quick and very repetitious and... Uh, I mean, I don't know, it's like watching another superhero movies, uh, superhero movie, you know, that I don't watch them, you know, God forbid, I would never go to a movie theater, you know, so it's just loud explosions, you know, and uh, I would be totally, my senses would be overwhelmed by the sound and, uh, and the color and all that, but even in uh, pass by, you know, and uh, whatever, my son or my daughter watch the kind of stuff, you know, I mean, it. Same thing, you know, if bullet chess. Karekin destroyed Meyer. And so won extremely close match. Interesting. So anyway, I'm not a big fan of this knight takes b7. Let's go on. So the most remarkable decision to me was queen e7. So MVL prefers this position. But now comes knight g2. So clearly, if white gets to put the knight on f4 and then eventually to g6, then the black king is in the mating knight. I would be scared. Well, he goes rook d8. You know, rook d8, right? Isn't that amazing in itself? We take moves like this for granted, but... Well, if there is no immediate threat, like we look at knight f4, knight f4 was played, but black counters with knight e6. So I guess he figured it was worth putting the rook on the open file, uh, even at the cost of abandoning the spawn. We take those things for granted already, but I mean, there is a lot of... Uh, there is a lot of research and practical uh, application behind all this. Obviously, we already have, uh, no, probably about 150 years of development of modern chess since the Morphe to, to this days to Carlson and the certain things that just, that just became ingrained in us. So we understand the dynamics, right? That the, even if we don't have any infiltration squares yet, but we go for it like MVL does, because we feel that 
no, you have to get active. Now, interesting. Rook takes b7. And we all played knight e5. A lot of people criticized this move and said, why didn't he go knight takes f4? Isn't this much safer? No, it's safer short term. But long term, I believe that he didn't want to allow the spawn to come from e3 to f4. Because it totally stops Black's direct play against f2. When the pawn is still on e3, you think I can hit f2 and if he moves f forward, then his king is going to be open on the second and I can attack the e3 maybe backward pawn. But after this, white just becomes rock solid here and what do you got left? Queen e6 on the check? No. This. Actually, if anything, well, in my opinion, white should be happy. White is the one who should be happy with the end game. In this end game, he has, goodness, the bishop and two pawns for rook and knight in totally open position without without any hindrance, you know, to his bishops and a very active rook. If anything, you know, I, I think white white would like to trade queens. Even if he doesn't get to win the game on the spot by checkmate, uh, but he's gonna have a very, very pleasant ride. So MVL doesn't want that. You know what's interesting about MVL? Uh, in this tournament, he admitted it himself. He said, I didn't play well. I had a lot of suspicious positions and, uh, well, and he said, you know, when I was when I had a, my chance to put pressure on people, there were always quick draws. So somehow he was getting in trouble with black and not getting anything with white. But it doesn't mean that his openings are poor. Obviously, there are not. It's just, uh, it's just often, you know, it's just bad luck, right? Uh, they hit the uh, right spots in their preparation and you keep on missing. You prepare for one thing and he plays something else. Or they keep playing the lines that you currently not sure how to meet and uh, they kind of sit on your repair shop and yet uh, they play them like they know. Um, Green foot player. Yeah, of course, dynamic play and it also develops the uh, player's thinking, uh, a player's thinking in, in certain ways. In the Grunfeld, you realize that you always have to counterpunch. Grunfeld is not the kind of opening that you can defend by, by simply defending. Most of the time when you, when white throws you in in the defensive, that means that already you, you've done something wrong. So he doesn't accept this position. Well, I hear this opinion all the time that the best players and certainly both Ding and, and MVL are some of the best players of today. With the gap between them and the very best Magnus Carlsen is not really that big anymore, right? Anyway, um, the opinion is that what, what makes them different from just regular 2700 guys is that they, they defend much better. Now, they defend better in uh, mainly in a sense of mental preparedness. They fight much harder to, to save those half points. That's what MVL did. And by the way, you'll, you'll see in this game as one of those games. So he didn't go for this. He goes knight a5. Bishop b2. No, well, little low on time. Ding basically plays not slower than others. He usually stays abreast on, on the clock with his opponent and uh, avoids unnecessary time trouble. He's no Grishuk, that's for sure. Um, but I guess he wanted to play this move always, right? To get the bishop in G7. And this is great because he cannot take. And uh, No, yet it's probably not the right move because the bishop on G6 was clearly his most valuable piece. 
in terms of control of the light squares and protection for the for his king. He had to go bishop e4. You're gonna love this. You say what? Knight c5, correct? Fork. And I say whatever. This is absolutely my favorite line. I eliminated the knight, and there comes the big fork. So you say, okay, I have to give one of my exchanges back. And that's exactly what I want. Once again, I get the bishop and two pawns. One thing I have to do, I have to make sure the queen stays on. Now, I only wanted to trade queens when I had an active rook. Now, uh, since a pair of rooks have been exchanged, I need some active piece to complement my bishops. Bishops are that bishop pair, always a long-term factor. The job for my queen is to attack a6. Or possibly g7. I'm gonna enjoy myself tremendously here. King g2, h4, h5, possibly h6. Great sense of security, you know. That's what... Hmm. That's what the modern society well, offers you with all the, all, all the cameras on every corner, you know, and all the uh, email intercepting and uh, listening devices over there and all the, you know... All the security and the uh, present of everywhere, you know. This is this is the dream kind of thing. Now, in reality, you don't get it very often. But this is how they describe life in 21st century. Your king is on G2, and you just have an easy ride in your life. Ha. Huh. Well, Dean could have had it. I guess I'm well... No. Maybe indeed pushed it a little too far in his attempt to wrestle the initiative out of Ding's hands. Luckily for him, bishop b2. Now he goes knight f3. Well, objectively speaking, knight f3 is not a good move because of some computer variations, but from a practical point of view, gamer's point of view, that's exactly what Kuprechik would have said. He said, I have to go knight f3. Don't matter. And say, yeah, yeah, I see those variations, but I still play knight f3. You can't just let the guy to have, like, no, peace of mind. No, here it's actually not, maybe it's not winning for white. But once again, white now is locking this bishop. That means the king is not absolutely safe. We're talking check, and then another check, and whatnot. So not, it's not your security blanket here. It's sort of, the blanket is missing. White square bishop. But nonetheless, white is better. Well, somehow he should find a way of keeping, keeping everything safe. Uh, once again. But from practical point of view, black shouldn't do this. He did the right thing, in my opinion. Knight f3. Although objectively speaking... It's probably not good enough. Now, oh, one good thing came out. Uh, because of possible invasion over there on uh, only one, white had to take with with the jeep on, which also looks okay. The king may be safe. Rook d2, moment of truth. Probably Ding, if he found the right move here, would have secure the first place in this tournament way before the last round. So after this move, obviously, black wants queen h4 and a massive attack and checkmate against f2. So white has to keep the black queen busy elsewhere. So g7 pawn, right? What else? Obviously, this is not good, right? He trades, checks you, and takes this, and it already looks kind of position white would be happy to draw, but he will never win. Uh, 
so he goes queen c3. So his plan is simple, right? To keep that queen from coming to h4. And it's battery, all good. Well, unfortunately, no, this is the moment and maybe Ding has room to improve. He calculates very accurately and, well, and of course he's no stranger to sharp play. You know? He had great games on the black side of the King's Indian. He didn't play it in this tournament, but I think he can, he can always play it. His King's Indian is, uh, has never went. Uh, but he just doesn't have, uh, I don't know, Nakamura-like or even MVL-like kind of a flair, you know, that in uh, uh, in in his attack. Well, the move Queen C6 was was better. No, it's the same thing, right? Forget about moving your queen actively anywhere. You must guard against queen h6 and then queen takes g7 mate. Maybe he simply missed that, uh, this idea of coming to, to h6. Additional benefit is that he's on the knight. And I analyze this. The only thing to do is to eliminate this bishop. Yeah, but now... No, black has some swindling chances, but objectively speaking, white is up upon and his king should be made much safer. Maybe even this move. Looks a little ugly. But I mean, we on this. If takes, then the knight is trapped. He goes back. Maybe we just play bishop e2. You don't have to like immediately take this knight. Now it's a threat. And there is also some kind of queen h1. I mean, knight takes h2, of course, is very risky, but what else to do? Knight d4 is a tactical shot. If you take, then queen h3. But maybe white just plays a cool move, king g2. I mean, white's pawn structure is so much healthier that I think white is simply winning here. No, obviously there is nothing to keep you safe from a determined man. Imagine if determined man works in construction, you know, like he's on top of a tall building, you know, just looking down there and picking and choosing whatever, when he's going to drop this concrete block. I mean, think of this, you know, as to your chances to be struck by lightning. Okay, they're very small. In some ways, you know, I even agree with modern politicians when they say, hey, you want to you wanna enjoy the big city of 21st century? It's a fact of life. We kind of like, you know, assume that there is always going to be some some amount of street crime, right? I mean, we try to live accordingly our lives, you know, then, I mean, don't stay out there past 11 p.m. or whatever, avoid bars, you know, city neighborhoods and that kind of stuff, you know, but, but I mean, apply it to the new reality as well. It's just part of it. Anyway, so in chess sense, you know, like white... I guess maybe he played queen c3, maybe he was getting a little low on time. Maybe he thought it was just good enough and there was no need to, to look at this. But the situation now is surprisingly different. Now comes this move, knight h2. Now everybody said, oh, king missed to win by playing king a1, but it's a difficult move to play, people. You're moving your king away from the knight, which is supposed to attack and capture, right? And you're moving your king kind of toward danger zone. And uh, this whole thing, you have to see queen c6. All right, well, yeah, but uh, if you have to see queen c6 now, why didn't you see or play it two moves ago when it was stronger? Surprisingly, it's not that easy to, to eliminate this knight. And the white king, no, like it or not, one move away from being checkmated. It's not the kind of a one-way street anymore. Next, you know, since the black king now has the afraid square, which is way safer than the h-file, because there will be no checkmate over there. 
A fate is relatively safe. Well, next it's gonna be queen h4. Even, even looking at this position now, with uh, all kinds of time that I have and uh, all that, I don't feel absolutely confident that white is totally winning. So I understand why Ding went king g1. But there it comes. There are always a tactic, right? Particularly when it's Vashiava graph. In this position, no escape for the king, and no escape for the king. Huh. Taking this, no well, there won't be any escape for the king over here, I don't think so. I don't see white winning this, he's gonna, his king is gonna go for a crazy run and... Uh, no, not good. Well, yeah, speaking of car accidents, indeed, you know, goodness. I don't know. Oh, well. So after rook takes a four, ding. So no other way but to, to simplify. And there it goes. End game now. Oh well. I mean, rook and bishop is a great combo in the end game, particularly when you have passed pawn or pawns. Now here you have two of them on the f file, but they kind of like close proximity to the black king, so it's hard to see why it just queen on that f pawn without bringing his king over to help, and that's hard to do because the somehow this knight survives. I mean, all I'm saying, you know, that obviously uh, this had to be played. On move 34. But I think this uh, roller coaster kind of thing, you know, and some surprising things that happened to this game simply made Ding Lereng think of his tournament situation. And he thought, oh, well, maybe that's enough. I'll just, I'll just take this. Rook end game up a pawn or two, double pawns, and see if there is a win over there. Well, it's sort of a comforting thought that you simply don't have one chance of losing the game. So the worst thing that could happen is just a draw. But oftentimes, you know, the, you use it to convince yourself, oh, stop fighting, let it be a draw. Deep in your heart of hearts, you know, he probably knew he was not going to win that rook end game. It just doesn't look winning. But yet he didn't play this move. Here is what I thought. There are two lines. One of them is knight g4. So which one do we go after? c7 or a6? I thought a6. To get a passer. Uh, rook f2. There. Now accurate move king h7. Obviously not king g7 because of this. Mm. F5. Moves the rook out. The problem is that the white king is cut off. I mean, I can kind of like think of do of doing this. F6. But there is... He's fairly close to... Fairly close to this uh, to this pawn with the king. So even if I get to do this kind of stuff, and I get to do this, he goes over there. I don't know. This doesn't work because he takes. It looks more drawish to me. I don't believe that uh, without the white king it can be won. No, well, that's better for white, no doubt about it. That's why he had to go bishop a8. It is hard to tell. Well, uh, I think you have to go bishop a8 by elimination. You simply don't even look what happens after bishop a8. You just look briefly at the rook endgame and see, okay, no, let's get real, it's a draw. Doesn't matter. Better side of a draw, worse side of a draw, it's still half a point. You want to continue the game, you, you say to yourself, play bishop a8, see what happens. 
Maybe he won't go there. Maybe he'll go night of three check. It's also possible. A4, this one. Coming to E4 and then winning on F2. Well, some winning chances for white, but... Okay, it, yeah, play on indeed. No, that's what Magnus Carlsen would have done. At least the Magnus Carlsen a few years ago. Now, I think his tendency to uh, prefer every trade, you know, to the non-trading solution is, is beginning to... Uh, to bite him, you know, so suddenly those uh, basics, no, simpler endings that he was always winning five years ago, they're no longer winning. Uh, be, do you know why? Because nothing lasts forever. You can figure out some kind of model in life and chess and you can like follow it and you can enjoy a degree of success, whatever, you know, like your ambition is. But one thing you should realize that nothing will last forever. Every person has to reinvent themselves. Oh well. So he took, no, well, took here. King G4. No, I don't know if he realistically thought, oh, okay, this is what's gonna happen. No, no well, nobody blunders like this, right? And indeed, in this position, white keeps the two extra pawns, and next he's gonna do check and throw the black king away. There is no check on the third to win the f4 pawn, and white is simply winning. But I don't think, you know, that a player of Ding's level automatically plays rook, rook takes f2 instead of the move king g4. Obviously, we all went king g4. So king g2 now forced. Rook d3. What I noticed, you know, well, uh, some time ago, I think that was Grand Chess Tour, but not last year. It was 2015. Anyway, this whole thing, you know, was coming to a close. They played in London, and uh, Magnus didn't really have a good series then, and he was just trying to catch up. And then he caught up, he won, he beat Grishuk in the last round of the London Classic in the game he could have lost. Uh, it's Grishuk in time trouble, his own time trouble, of course. Mr. Fairly obvious exchange sacrifice that would give him a crushing attack against the abandoned white king. Magnus went with his pieces to the queen side, get some pawns. Anyway, Magnus wins and then they get into this tie break thing, you know. So Magnus somehow, there were three-way tie, Giri, MVL, and Carlson. And somehow Carlson, maybe because of whatever, you know, so he, he was given a bye, right, in the first round of this playoff. Somehow they didn't do it to three ways. Probably they thought it was just going to be one point each for, for every player and it's going to go forever. They wanted elimination. So anyway, and MVL somehow eliminated Giri, and now he plays Carlson. What was at stake it was ridiculous. Not only the, the whole thing at the London tournament, since they, I've never seen this before, they didn't share Grand Prix points. Okay, Grand Chess Tour points. See, they share points. Can you see that on the cross table? 71 and 3 sevens each for like whatever here, seven players, from who you find to, to Giri. This is how it's supposed to be. Instead, what they did at that tournament, they, they used this, okay, we're going to play some blitz tie breaks, and uh, this is going to be your placing in the final standing, the result of the tie break. And, uh, and the, the Grand Chess Tour points you'll get accordingly, which in my understanding is totally ridiculous. No, anyway, so MVL loses a drone rook endgame to Carlson. And Carlson captures the London Grand Prix thing and the, uh, not Grand Prix, Grand Chess Tour. And the whole Grand Chess Tour. The difference was, I don't know what, no, at least 50 grand, maybe more. I think after that MVL told himself, enough is enough. Time for me to put my foot down and work on them rook endgames. And he saved a couple in this tournament. 
One against Grishuk and this one too. Yeah, I don't think Carlson has the key advantage anymore. Well, and uh, besides, no, Carlson's big advantage was in his physical conditioning. Now, he still has it. First of all, there are older guys who are never going to be uh, equal to Carlson in that department. There are Kramniks and Anans. Okay, there are fewer and fewer on them. But, okay. Um, but some of these guys, you know, well, they, like Karyakin did. Well, I don't know if Karyakin did any chess preparation for the match. I think he just played tennis every day, you know, and worked on his physical conditioning. I saw him much improved, you know, and... Uh, in terms of his um, physical shape, and that's why he stood, you know, with Magnus, we, we stood Magnus's uh, pressure for 12 games. Others, you know, they'll probably come around to that too, if they can, I don't know. If they don't, you know, then eventually they're going to pay the price. You can only play good chess, you know, until you're 30 years old, if you don't do any, any sports and physical conditioning. After 30, you know, then you're going to have... Uh, you're going to have problems. Now see Aronian, what happened to him. So anyway, rook d3 was a great move, and now, okay, what to do? He's just going after the pawn, not allowing white to protect it laterally. Since he is the one to attack this a pawn first, he gets it. So f3 is the only move, and now king h5. That was already unnecessary. He could have gone king f5. Now, uh, if you ask me why not take the spawn I guess you could yeah I don't see white winning this the king is in front of the pawn no white will try on granted white will try on but I don't see white winning this Maybe he, he felt, you know, that would, would give uh, Ding, you know, chances to continue, so he went King H5. Giri goes to the gym. Th this is good. Yeah, of course, Giri should lift. You know, no, no, hey, you know, well, he'll put some meat on those bones, you know, before he notices it. Anyway, well, his, if, if anybody, his wife would be very happy, you know, if he, Giri started lifting. No, yeah, ask Marie Sasha. Clearly, the guy lifts every day, you know, no, and probably more than that. Let's leave it to Ashley, indeed, you know. Uh, so, this seemed like a try, right? Check. But then the king comes up. So, MVL always had this counter attack in mind. And now it becomes interesting. F5, rook check, only move. Why? Because if you take the pawn, then after f6, white wins. He manages to create this very unusual position with his rook and two pawns. Look how he totally shut the blocking out of play. All you can do is just to try to go around, and you still go nowhere. You cannot cross the fifth, and, and the approaches to the rook are guarded by the pawn. White just walks with the king, he's in the square of the a pawn, takes the pawn and then goes to his own. It's a funny position. But of course, in reality, uh, MVL had a draw with rook d2. King of one, king g3. What he does in this line, he, he simply gets... gets to attack one of the pawns. Either he was threatening to take and come from behind, or he's gonna get them this way. No, either way you cut it, you know, like I don't see white doing anything here, any kind of progress. Rook goes there, there is always check followed by king takes f3. No, two on one, what do you expect? No, they played some moves, but it already didn't matter. White spawns are not advanced enough to, even with the blocking cut off. Uh, no, well, it's a standard defense using this uh, 
side checks and there is enough distance between the black rook and the and the white king i'm not even confident that white can win this position even if there was no pawn on a5 that would be an interesting question but nowhere to go draw great oh well So anyway, I, I chose this game that kind of <coughs> <coughs> went below the radar somewhat because it was a draw. First of all, I, I wanted to point out that despite this uh, only 26% of decisive games in the current Grand Prix uh, tournament, no, it wasn't totally devoid of action. Although I agree with the critics that some players, um, no, including Mamidyarov, I mean, others, Rajabov, I didn't expect anything else, but he just wants, he just wants to make draws. Well, I mean, that's, that's it. But Mamidyarov obviously is a more ambitious player, but I think he went into a bit of a celebration mode because he figured, okay, I'm on plus two. I got my rating to 2,800. Let's not screw it up. And uh, maybe he figured with my kind of points I have, you know, well, I'm, uh, I'm gonna be in a good position for the Grand Prix thing anyway. Which he is. He's in first place, 280 points. So anyway, that's basically the story. Guys, uh, I gotta tell you, you know, I'm I'm a bit under the weather, you know. I barely was able to sit there for two hours talking to you. I uh, a bit burned out, you know. I need to I need to take this long weekend off and uh, not to look at any chess hopefully i'll come back uh, stronger and uh, as far as our next meeting count two weeks from now i don't think there is going to be much to talk about uh, on the first on the eighth we will have something to talk about so we part for two weeks now and uh, thank you for staying with me and uh no well, Enjoy your long weekend if you're in the United States or enjoy your summer elsewhere. Enjoy your winter if you're in the southern hemisphere. Enjoy your life. Every Russian schoolboy knows. <laughs>